Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. Now, we want to talk about a brand new trial we're going to be covering here on the network. We expect opening statements today at 1 p.m., and it's out of South Carolina, and it is the trial of Timothy Jones Jr. This is a disturbing one. This is a father who is accused of killing his five children, ages one through eight. Now, as if it couldn't get worse just listening to that, he is also accused of taking the bodies of these children, putting them in his car, and driving around with them for several days, over a week and a half, in the southern United States, going from state, state to state. He's accused, he's, it's alleged that he then deposited their bodies in, in rural Alabama, but he was then arrested in Mississippi on a drunk driving charge. Now, we believe the defense is gonna go forward with an insanity defense, very similar to what we're covering in the Stephen Burgoyne case out of Vermont, and we have a lot to break down and a lot more to discuss in this case. And joining me is a expert on this case, a very special guest, anchor and reporter from Watch Fox News. Uh, Courtney King is here, and she is also the host of the Timothy Jones Trial podcast, which is available on Apple, iTunes, Spotify, or WACH.com. Courtney, great to have you here on Long Crime. Well, thank you for having me. Okay, I want to, I mean, you're the expert on this case, so let's get right into it. First, what's the feeling in the community about the beginning of this trial? I know a lot of people have been focusing on it. Well, I think the community is, is just, it seems weird to say happy, but I think they're happy to finally see it come to trial because this happened four and a half years ago. It actually happened right before I came here um, as a reporter at Anchor. So I think the relief to see it finally go to trial, it's been a very long road. Um, but outside of that relief, there's still a lot of heartache from it. I mean, this is, it's a talker. Wherever I go, people want to talk to me about the case because they're so concerned, especially parents. Um, for them, they're horrified about what happened, especially people who want to be parents that can't be parents yet are, are just very confused as to why something like this would happen. So it, it's really shaken this community. I'm sure it has. And, and look, it's a big discussion. So you were covering jury selection. Were there any issues in terms of getting a jury that didn't know about this case or at the very least, or and if at the very most, they knew about it, but they said they could be impartial? I mean, what do we know about this jury that was selected? Well, so actually that came up yesterday. The defense has moved for a change in venue at least five times. And yesterday they did that because they said at least five of the jury members had stated that they had heard um, publicity about the case. However, it was a very long process and the judge and both the defense and prosecutors uh, went over each and every one of those juror members on what they knew about the case and what they had heard. And they all had said, all the ones that were seated had said that they believed that they could put it aside because they really just wanted to hear what happened or how it happened and why. So I believe only five of them said that they had heard publicity that were seated yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was a long process with jurors who had said that they had heard something because the first day of jury selection when almost 200 Lexington County residents came to the old courthouse, the judge asked who has heard publicity on the case. And I would say between a third and a half of those people stood up. So, oh, wow. I mean, yeah, I, there were several people during jury selection who had just moved here who didn't know about it. Right. Um, but the majority had at least heard something. Courtney, you had mentioned why. Why did this happen? That's the thing I think most people are trying to understand. Why would Timothy Jones Jr., according to the prosecution, why would he kill his five children? What are they saying about a potential motive here? Well, I think that's what people are confused about with the motive, and we're probably going to find that out from the trial. We know right now that the Jones, um, Amber Jones, Timothy Jones, were divorced for about a couple years when this happened. Also, Timothy Jones had primary custody of the children. A lot of people were concerned about why there was never an Amber Alert issued, um, but that was because he was the primary parent of the kids in terms of custody. I know Amber was trying to get custody back of the children. So that confuses people about the motive because they don't understand. You know, a lot of times in these types of cases where parents kill, you see a parent who's trying to get custody back. Maybe there's a revenge factor of it. Um, we have heard that one of the deaths of the children was an accident, and that's at least what the defense is saying, and then the other deaths happened from there. But, you know, there's not too much information about that. We're gonna find that out from trial. So, 
Again, the defense is pleading not guilty by reason of insanity, so I think they're trying to prove right now that he was insane while it happened. So that to them, the defense, that's their motive. If I understand it correctly, if his insanity defense ultimately were to work and he would be found not guilty by reason of insanity, it would be the first death penalty case in South Carolina where this would ultimately work. Am I correct in thinking about this? I believe you are correct because I've actually asked every former prosecutor, every lawmaker, I know if there's ever been a case like this, and all of them said they didn't think so. Even the own prosecution team in this this case, I asked them, and, and they said there's some similar cases, but they have not seen this yet. So this would, I believe so, be the first in the states. Now, now there have been some, some similar ones where people were found guilty right. but mentally ill, but this might be the first we'll see of the insanity. Plea. Courtney, I mentioned yeah. this. I mentioned this at the top, and uh, this is our final question because I know we have to let you go. The idea of that he was pulled over, I think, in Mississippi. How did they attach him to the crime? How did they? Do we know the evidence that they have ultimately against him because he didn't have the bodies in his car? If I'm understanding it correctly. Well, there was blood found in the car when he was pulled over, and that's kind of what the, got the ball rolling with, um, with. Uh, law enforcement in Mississippi. There were also notes, written, handwritten notes about how to commit the crime, how to dispose of bodies. So also there was the smell because it had been a few days. So that's what got law enforcement in Mississippi involved and why it wasn't just a stop for a DUI. So from there, I, I, they were able to match up that the children and Mr. Jones were reported missing by Amber Jones when he failed to show up to bring her the children when it was her turn for, uh, according to that custody arrangement. Right. Wow. I'm just looking at the children right here. It's such a sad case, but I know we're all going to be following it, including Courtney. And Courtney, you know, you have such a great podcast. I encourage everyone to listen to it. If you want to follow more about this case, again, it's called the Timothy Jones Trial Podcast. It's available on Apple, iTunes, Spotify, or WACH.com. Courtney King, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.